Um, I'll, um, I have a, I, I like to collect affiliations, so here are mine. Um, I want to point to uh, the one, I have no way to point, unfortunately, but um, uh, so my, my, um, my spin-off startup company, Cypher, basically is uh, develop, if bringing machine learning technology and deep learning technology sort of to, to society and to industry. The next one is my uh, research group at, uh, at the University of Amsterdam. And uh, more recently, we opened uh, Cuva Lab, which is a joint lab uh, between Qualcomm Technologies and the University of Amsterdam, um, thinking about developing new technology around uh, computer vision and uh, deep learning. Um, also try to up, make up a little bit of the time, so maybe I don't need so long. Um, so in uh, personalized healthcare, I want to talk a little bit about um, personalized or precision healthcare, where I think uh, unsupervised learning is going to play a, ma a major role. And, um, you know, in, there's huge opportunities in healthcare. Uh, first of all, there's lots of data. Uh, sequence data is coming online very cheaply. Uh, you know, it's, the cost is falling faster, in fact, uh, than uh, Moore's Law, as you see in the picture there. Uh, and pretty soon we'll be able to sequence our entire DNA for maybe a thousand euros or something. So basically everybody will have their DNA on a credit card sized sort of format. Um, so digital uh, patient records are being uh, you know, standardized, which is going to be very helpful as well. And uh, there's an explosive growth in terms of medical imaging, like MRI, you know, X-ray, CT, PET, CAT, you know, what, name it. So that's the data. There's also lots of opportunities. Um, you know, in the Netherlands, uh, recently there was a, a, a message in the news that said that about half of the medical procedures um, has not actually been validated against sort of data. I'm not saying that these procedures don't work. I'm just saying that, you know, they have not been explicitly validated. So there's a lot of, you know, interesting work that can be done there. Also, every year uh, people uh, die because they get the wrong uh, dosage of drugs prescribed. You know, we're all different. Um, and, and, you know, and clearly, um, you know, you want to prescribe drugs at a personalized basis. And also every, every year, pe lots of people die because of surgical complications. And this is actually very interesting uh, because these complications uh, show themselves already quite early after the surgery, um, yet uh, they're not being detected and they only get detected when the situation is pretty bad already. Um, now, from a machine learning point of view, there's very interesting challenges. And this is not a standard case of just applying your deep learning software to this new field. Um, there is, uh, in particular, there's the problem that the amount of information or the amount of features that you can extract from a particular, for a particular patient is gigantic. It's like maybe a terabyte per patient fairly soon. Um, yet there's not many patients, fortunately, but, um, you know, compared to all that data. So, you know, in a particular hospital we may have, you know, I've been working with data sets with a few hundred. If you're lucky, you get a few thousand patients. And that's the kind of studies you're looking at. Of course, across all hospitals, you may have many more patients, but because of privacy laws, you cannot aggregate all that data. Um, and another uh, sort of technical challenge is that the data is actually very heterogeneous. It's very different. You know, DNA sequences are very different from, you know, from a medical image. And how do you combine all these different sources of information? Um, so just a brief word on the, what they call the curse of dimensionality, or, you know, this is a term that has been around, of course, uh, for a while. Uh, you know, there's lots of data, as I already uh, said, like medical imaging data, genomic data, gene expression data. In general, there's a huge amount of uh, molecular profiling data around um, for patients. So the other one is what I call the curse of privacy. Now, it sounds maybe a bit funny in the sense that privacy should be a good thing, and it is a good thing. The problem, though, is that, you know, Privacy law, laws in Europe are getting stricter, which basically means it gets very difficult to aggregate data, uh, you know, between hospitals. And, you know, this is a curse in the sense that it will hold us back in training new models um, and, uh, and, and providing better health care. Um, I think there are solutions to this, even technical solutions, which are very interesting, which will maintain privacy. Uh, these are, you, don't, you should not try to put the data together in one source. You should keep it at the hospitals, but you should develop algorithms that will move between these data sources. And any time you, you send anything out of a hospital, you need to have some mathematical guarantee that there's no information flowing that will uh, reveal anything about an individual patient. And there is very nice framework for this. It's called differential privacy. 
and um, I think it's, it's, you know, the algorithms might already be there, it's just that you know, we need to implement them. Um, so now, uh, slightly more technical. Um, so I'm going to zoom in a little bit on the possible solutions for the technical problems, um, especially the one that has to do with that there's many more pieces of information per patient than we actually have patients, which is exactly the opposite as we have in the normals, like Google type environment where we have lots and lots of data, lots of images, lots of video, um, and you know, less uh, features. Um, so one way to, uh, to improve these models is by injecting expert knowledge. You know, doctors know what they're doing, hopefully, right? And it's a good idea to listen to them and to bring their expertise and encode them into your models. Um, the next one is to combine different data sets. If you have, uh, you know, let's say one study of MRI for uh, Alzheimer's disease, you have another study on, on MRI images for uh, sort of brain tumors, you should be able to combine these, even though they're different studies, you should be able to combine them to gain statistical strength. And finally, we should also use a lot of unannotated un data. You know, annotation is expensive. You need expensive doctors to do the annotation for you. Um, but there's a lot of MRI images around, and all of that should be aggregated, and models should be trained on them. And I'm saying that um, you know, this can be, these three, first three points can actually be very nicely uh, modeled by what are called generative models. Um, and um, so below there in the picture, you see an example of a generative model, a, a particular one that I'll uh, talk a little bit more about. So um, we have some labels Y. So Y is, say, the disease state that you have. S is, for instance, uh, a hospital. So let's say hospital ID. Where did you do the scan? And then Z is abstract factors or latent variables um, that you want to use to model your, your data. And um, all of these go into sort of a neural net, a deep neural network architecture to then produce or synthesize, as one of the speakers um, called it, to synthesize uh, your image X or your data X, okay? And then there's this other model. This is, this is the yin-yang, I think, that we heard before. Um, so there is this other model which goes in the opposite direction. It takes all the observed quantities, X and S in this case, it pushes it again through a neural network and it produces latent representation Z and from that latent representation Z you can then produce the label. So the left hand side is your classifier, goes from the observations to the predictions of the label and the right hand side is the synthesizer or the generative model that goes the opposite. And there's a very nice framework that puts these two together going back to the Helmholtz machine uh, by Jeff Hinton um, and um, Basically, it, uh, the left-hand side it can function to, to improve the learning for the right-hand side and, uh, and vice versa. So these two feed off of each other in some sense. Okay, so there's other uh, tricks you can play to improve uh, your, um, your models if there's a little data. Uh, and one is exploiting symmetries. And we've heard a very nice uh, brief talk about this for the plankton classification uh, today. So, you know, exploiting symmetries and being smart about, you know, if you have a data point in a particular orientation and you already know that it doesn't matter in which orientation you find it, you can do very smart things, as we've seen, um, in order to include those, those symmetries into your model. And uh, we are working on, on that as well. Um, then uh, there's this thing which, uh, which is effective, but I don't think many people are yet aware of, which is to remove known uh, causes of uh, variation that do not generalize well. So let's say you have an MRI image um, and you're doing a study and half of your images were taken in some hospital where the disease is, uh, you know, where people treat very bad, you know, progression of the disease. And then there is another hospital where people treat very light progression of the disease. Now what's gonna happen is that the, the details of the machine are going to heavily correlate with how bad the disease is, right? And so the actual hospital or the machine ID is going to be very predictive for the you know, disease state. Now clearly when you go to a new hospital, this is not something that will generalize very well because this was random. You have the information, the information is S, which is hospital ID, and you should try to purge it from your representation. It's not just not included, you should completely try to purge it from your representation. This is sometimes known as domain adaptation or transfer learning, but it can be very effective in, in these data sets, especially when the number of data cases that you have is very small. Okay, so here's some equations then, so uh, feel free to close your eyes. So, the, uh, so in, um, what I'm gonna say a few words about is the Bayesian learning. So I think 
Oh, actually, this is something I didn't say quite yet here. So Bayesian approaches to reduce overfitting is the last one. You know, overfitting clearly is the problem, is a problem here if you have a lot of information and few data cases. Um, and Bayesian approaches can really help here. Okay, so what I'm going to show you here, so the little video there is a, what we call a sampler. It uh, basically, every, every point that it touches is you can think of as an entire neural network. So basically, it's, it really lives in a very high dimensional space. And it's sort of moving around in the space of possible neural networks. Um, and it's collecting all these neural networks and then averaging predictions over all of these neural networks. And these can be thousands of, or, or, or tens of thousands of neural networks that it wants to make sort of, uh, sort of average, average its predictions over. And um, so what we see on the right below there is basically that, you know, the, the left is the true posterior distribution and the right is the one that it's sampled from. The, the particular equation that I show here is a, a variant that is actually very efficient. MCMC or sampling algorithms are very slow because every, every update that you have to do has to look at all the data, which you know, if you have a large data set, it doesn't work very well. And this one is very efficient. It basically is stochastic gradient descent, the algorithm that we all um, uh, know and love for uh, deep learning. But you just add the right amount of noise. That's all. You just add the noise. If you add the right amount of noise, then this thing will actually sample you know, from the um, from the posterior distribution, approximately. Okay, so then um, we all know that you know it. it uh, you, you can train very, very large neural networks in the order of billions of uh, of, uh, of parameters, and if you have like thousands of these, you cannot store them in memory. Um, and um, so this is a this is work that I did with my former student and um, some people at Google, uh, Mountain View, where basically we say, well, if we want the um, the benefits of a, of a Bayesian treatment of neural networks, um, how can we make sure that we train, that we do so at the cost of a single neural network? So we really want a single neural network that, is, that, that behaves in a similar way as this huge ensemble of all of these neural networks. Um, and, you know, without going maybe in too much detail, um, the idea is that you have a, a teacher network uh, which is all of, basically is this ensemble of all of these networks. And you have a student network, which is Q here, and you're trying to sort of match these together. So the student network can only have one set of parameters, and the teacher network can have lots and lots of parameters or an ensemble. And you try to make the student network look like the teacher network. And the nice thing is you can do this in an online way. So you can train this by basically sampling data points and sampling from your posterior distribution as you go and making updates to the student network so that it will imitate um, uh, the behavior of the teacher. Um, so maybe I'll just skip this because I seem to only have two minutes left um, and there's too many equations on this slide. The idea here is that we have just written a paper on um, interpreting dropout. So dropout is a way to uh, regularize your neural networks to make sure that they don't overfit. You've probably heard the term. And you can reinterpret um, dropout as a, um, as, a, as a posterior Bayesian inference algorithm um, that runs very efficiently. And now you can actually learn the dropout rate. So you can actually learn things about dropout that in ordinary dropout you couldn't, um, which is, for instance, how much should I drop out? And then in terms of domain invariance, um, the idea is maybe just look at the picture below. So this is a phase data set, uh, a phase data set where you have the actual illumination conditions for every image. Um, and if you would just cluster or do a T-SNE sort of uh, embedding of the original data, what you see is that it clusters basically on the illumination. That's the dominant degree of, uh, you know, the, the dominant degree is variation in this data. So this, think of the hospital example where, you know, you're not interested in actually, uh, you know, the hospital ID. Uh, you want to factor that out. In this case, it's the illumination. On the right-hand side, we have built this representation that's explicitly invariant uh, to this illumination. Um, and you'll see that if you then cluster, it will not cluster around the um, illumination. It will just cluster about the, 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 the face ID. So it will actually cluster pe the different images for the same person around each other. And this will actually help you a lot with making predictions. And, you know, this is something that you can do for MRI images as well. So here's a bunch of healthcare projects uh, that we do, you know, at our company, Cypher, and at my, in my lab, MLab. We're looking at uh, digital tissue slides, uh, analyzing, um, you know, uh, cells that are in mitosis, for instance. And we're looking at uh, microtyping gut bacteria, which is like 
you look at how many bacteria of each kind you can find in the gut, um, and then um, and then you um, and then you try to predict, for instance, when, whether somebody has uh, Crohn's disease. And uh, there's two more, um, for instance, Alzheimer here. I'll show you this picture real quick. So this is a very simple idea where we, instead of training with a deep neural net, we use a scattering transform, which is something you don't train, but you just do. Um, and then you build a classifier on top, and that works better than the state of the art. Okay, so the conclusions are, I think there is a huge amount of opportunity for deep learning in the life sciences and healthcare, um, but uh, it's not a standard run-of-the-mill application of your sort of uh, healthcare toolbox, or sorry, of your deep learning toolbox. Uh, there's two important, but probably more important hurdles to overcome. One is the curse of privacy, and the other one, the more technical one, is the curse of dimensionality. Um, and I've talked about generative models, uh, Bayesian learning, and domain invariance to make that happen. Thank you. Sorry for going over time. <laughs> <laughs>